Schwab Asset Management is proud to support the Inside ETFs podcast. As one of the nation's largest ETF providers, Schwab Asset Management offers insights and perspectives that can help advisors build on their ETF expertise. Did you know that more millennials are choosing ETFs as their investment vehicle of choice, or that many investors plan to increase their allocation to fixed income, smart beta, and actively managed ETFs? Find out how ETFs can support your clients' goals with Schwab Asset Management's educational resources. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash ETF know-how. Hello and welcome to Inside ETFs, the podcast where we bring the latest and greatest ETF industry perspectives directly to you through in-depth conversations with key thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm your host, Douglas Jonas, the head of exchange-traded products at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Now, today we have a roundtable event with the leadership team at Janice Henderson, a global asset manager with a broad spectrum of investment capabilities and with over $360 billion in assets under management. The theme today is ETFs for inflation. I can think of no better theme. And I am joined by Nick Cherney. He is the head of exchange traded products for Janice Henderson, also the former CIO and co-founder at Velocity Shares, as well as a former portfolio manager for iShares. He's accompanied by John Kirshner. John is the portfolio management for the AAA CLO ETF, ticker symbol JAAA, focused on CLOs and floating rate securities. We have Greg Cool. He is the portfolio manager for the U.S. real estate ETF, ticker symbol JRE, focused on REITs and real estate securities. And of course, Tim Gerard. Tim is the portfolio manager for the Net Zero Transition Resources ETF, ticker symbol JZRO or J0. And that ETF focuses on resource securities for the transition to a low carbon future team. Thank you so much for being here. Nick, I want to come right to you. Boy, the markets have been anything but predictable this year. The, the Fed is meeting as we are speaking, and their focus and action continues to be on inflation affecting the markets. What should advisors be focused on right now? Yeah, thanks, Doug, and thank, thanks for, for uh, having us. Um, yeah, the timing couldn't uh, really be more um, optimal for, for talking about inflation. Um, luckily, I, I get to just sort of hype the problem um, and we've got uh, experts from our portfolio management team to get into some of the solutions. But, you know, it's everybody's focused on inflation. Obviously, the May reading at 8.6 percent increase was the, the highest reading in in, in 40 years. Um, and, you know, interestingly, I was I was reading something the other day that Larry Summers just put out some research focused on sort of whether or not we are, in fact, uh, in a significantly better position than we were the last time we faced this problem in the 80s. Um, and what's interesting is that we, we changed the way we measured CPI um, after some of the inflation issues in, in the 80s. And if you if you use the current measurement, the high back then, instead of being 14.8%, would have been only about 11.5%. And so we're actually much closer to the situation that we were, that Volcker faced in the 80s, than, than I think people realize. And that's just really to say inflation in some ways and the problem is, is worse than I think people really understand. Um, and there's a lot of um, you know issues around that. Obviously, front and center today, as you mentioned with the Fed, is, is the impact in terms of rising rates. But, but really what it means is that investors need to answer a, a, a real simple problem without necessarily a simple solution. And that's you know how to invest for real returns when you have an 8% hurdle rate with inflation where it is, um, you have significant duration headwinds with the Fed, um, you know, calling for probably 3 to 4% Fed fund rate by the end of the year and, and sort of extreme stock market volatility. And, and I think that leaves a lot of people with the idea that there's kind of nowhere to hide. And, and in some ways that, that can be true. But I think if you focus on those three things, which is real return, managing duration and managing stock market volatility, uh, you, you can certainly be fairly well positioned. And so, uh, yeah, I'm really excited that we're able to join you today and, and talk about those topics. Nick, I want to kind of bring up a point, right? You're talking about, you know, the last time period being the 80s, which is basically 40 years ago. So, so it's very likely we have in the investment public an entire generation of investors who've, who've never really seen inflationary times, how should investors be thinking about their ability to build robust portfolios in the midst of persistent inflation? I mean, it really fundamentally takes an important tool off the table, right? And that tool is cash, right? Historically, for most investors, like you say, who are kind of active today, 
there's been a simple tool to de-risk and that's going to cash. And now on a real return basis, going to cash means losing eight and a half percent a year. Um, and so your, your purchasing power is eroding if you're sitting in cash, um, even with Fed funds rates where they are and short-term interest rates where they are in terms of bank balances, you know, you have very significant negative real returns. And that just hasn't been the case for a long time. And so, you know, I think again, what it, what it means is that people need to change their, their mentality a little bit. I think history can, you know, certainly be a guide here, right? What's worked in the past in inflationary environments. This is not the same as what was going on in the eighties, right? Right? The causes are different. The underlying economic situation is different. Um, the politics are certainly different. So we can't just simply go and, and hit repeat on, on what was happening then. Um, but there are lessons to be learned. I mean, I think it'll be interesting when we when, when we talk to Tim a little bit about the transi- transition to net zero. Right? That's a very fundamental uh, global phenomenon that's going on right now that just just wasn't part of the picture back then. So there's a lot of interesting things, but we need to focus on real return, assets that can deliver real return and assets that can protect us in a rising rate environment. So John, I wanna come over to you. You're, you're the portfolio manager, you're managing this ETF JAAA. Why CLOs, right? Why, why CLOs versus uh, some other floating rate instrument, particularly as we're talking about the, this inflationary environment? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Doug. And when we were out there, talking to investors um, about fixed income, first and foremost, what we're hearing is investors are just confused. To Nick's point, you know, there's no place to hide or it feels like there's no place to hide. Traditionally, they've gone into cash. That doesn't seem to be a solution right now. So what we're hearing is, wow, we see the two-year treasury at 3.3%. Why don't I just put my fixed income money there and wait until I think rates are going to start rallying again. The problem is if you did that at the beginning of the year, you'd actually be negative close to 4% just because of uh, that short-term rates have gone up about 250 basis points. So even that isn't really a solution. So our solution, JAAA is what we like to call it, J-A-A-A is the ticker, is a floating rate CLO ETF that's 90% AAA, so very high credit quality, which we think is imperative in this type of a market since we're almost for sure headed to, if not a recession, at least much slower growth. And at the same time, as the Fed continues to raise interest rates, the yield on this product, because it is floating rate, will continue to go up. Now, fixed income, most people think, is fixed. And for about 95% of fixed income in the US, it is fixed. Um, But there are certain pockets, one of them being CLOs that is floating rate. So here you have a product that is a solution for investors who want the Fed interest rate hikes to be a tailwind and not a headwind. It's currently yielding right about the same as a two-year treasury on a current yield basis at 3.3%. But if you take those Fed rate hikes that the market has priced in over the next year, the yield is actually projected to go up to 5.3%. Now, we can't guarantee that, obviously, because we don't know what the Fed is going to do. But bottom line is, if the Fed keeps raising rates, a lot of fixed income securities are going to be negatively affected by that. JAAA will be positively affected by that. Yeah, John, I want to go back to that statement because I've heard you say that before. Fixed income doesn't always have to be fixed. It, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, traditionally, if you go out and buy, let's just take it very simply and say a 10 year treasury, again, similar type rates right now. Let's say you buy a new one, the coupon, let's just say, is three and a quarter percent. Basically, you get interest payments every six months. And then at the end of the 10 years, you get your principal back. And so if you held that 10 year treasury, you would be getting fixed interest payments twice a year and your return would be 3.25% if you held it for 10 years. That's how most uh, fixed income works in the US. Corporate bonds are are like that as well. Mortgages are a little bit different, but but very similar in that the, the coupon payments you get are pretty fixed. Now, there are a few pockets, CLOs, like I said, being one of them, that are floating rate, which means you have an index, in this case, either three-month LIBOR or the the new SOFR rate, and that will move up and down over time, basically based on what the Fed is doing with 
the Fed funds rate. So LIBOR now is three month LIBOR now is about 2%. That was close to zero just about a year ago. And as the Fed continues to hike rates, that LIBOR rate will continue to go up. And that means the coupon income you're getting from CLOs that are benchmarked off their, that LIBOR rate will continue to go up as well. So, so John, what is it about your team? You know, what is it about Janice Henderson? What, what, what is it that allows you and your team to focus and manage this type of ETF? Yeah, is, that's a great question. I mean, first and foremost, we've been doing this for a very long time and we have a track record of success. I mean, that, that's really table stakes for investing in any asset class. But secondly, I, I don't think it should be minimized the amount of work that goes in to um, doing due diligence on the 130 managers out there that issue CLOs. There's also a tremendous amount of quantitative modeling uh, around these securities based on the underlying leverage loans in the portfolios, and then surveillance of the portfolios once we buy them to make sure that the CLO managers are doing what they say they are. And then finally, the collaboration with our corporate credit group. I'm in our securitized group, which is mortgages, commercial mortgages, things like that. But our corporate credit group always has a view on the underlying leverage loans. And we make sure that their view of the world aligns with the CLO managers whose CLOs we are buying. For example, let's just say our corporate credit group doesn't really like healthcare. And we go and meet a manager and they love healthcare. Well, we're going to ask a lot of very seriously hard questions of why that is the case. And if we don't like their answers, we're just not going to buy that manager. So tremendous amount of work, both qualitative and quantitative, goes into this process. And it shows up based on our track record of investing in CLOs. Yeah, it's it's one more reason. You know, I just love the ETF wrapper where you know all of us have access to what is really institutional level investing. And you know, Greg, I want to come over to you. You're you're managing JRE, the Janice Henderson Real Estate ETF. Can you explain how adding real estate to a portfolio can potentially help in inflationary times? Yeah, happy to do that. And I think you know, if you were to to speak with a number of investors about how do you hedge against inflation? I think almost a knee-jerk reaction in a lot of cases is to own real estate. Um, and there are some good reasons for that. And I think I'll, I'll sort of break it into two parts. You know, One of them is more theoretical. One of them is very practical. Starting from the theoretical side, you know, this is a real asset. And I think unlike a lot of other companies, you know, unlike a lot of other types of assets, we can very readily estimate what is the replacement cost of a building based on the inputs, based on land, steel, glass, concrete, all of that. And so from a theoretical perspective, as the price of all those inputs go up, labor included, the value of, of buildings goes up. Um, you know, replacement cost analysis is, is a sort of core way of valuing real estate. So that's the more theoretical side. I, I think I want to spend a little bit more time on the practical side, which has to do with kind of the cash flows that these buildings can generate. So you know, I think in, in a lot of cases, real estate, a commercial real estate is based on contractual income. Uh, and in many cases that has annual escalators, which are often tied directly to inflation. So you may have a built-in cash flow stream that automatically keeps up with inflation, depending on what you're investing in. That is to us, you know, natural built-in inflation protection. Um, the other thing that we think about is similar to our colleagues in fixed income, there is a, a way that we can manage duration within a real estate portfolio. So if you think about the different types of commercial real estate that we can invest in, there are different lease durations that exist in all of those types of buildings. You have hotels on the far extreme on one side, that's a one night lease. They reprice every single day. And then on the other extreme, you might have a hospital that might have a 30 year lease, uh, which they can't reprice for quite a long time. So we have the ability as, as active managers with JRE to tilt the portfolio towards shorter duration or longer duration if we think we want exposure to repricing you know, more frequently, which is kind of what we're doing right now. We, we want that ability to reprice. You know, I'll, I'll give a simple example. If you look at the way that CPI is calculated, um, the single largest component of CPI is, is shelter or, or rent effectively. Now you can invest in that through apartment REITs, 
uh, which is which is a meaningful holding for us. So I think you know REITs, commercial real estate has this ability to sort of naturally keep up from a cash flow perspective with inflation. Um, and you know, unlike some other businesses, there's not a huge you know labor component. There's not a huge input cost component to the business. You're you're dealing with a fixed asset. So um, from the expense side, I think you have less exposure than elsewhere. And as an active manager, you have the ability to tilt the portfolio to benefit or or not from from rising prices and repricing more quickly. So, are there particular trends that you're seeing now, and and how do you sort of compare that back to the the pandemic period? Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting question because things are changing so rapidly at the moment. I, I think you know what we've seen both you know before, during, and after the pandemic is really continued strength in what we think are some long-term secular winning property types. You know, some examples there would be uh, industrial warehouses, you know, single family rental, tech real estate, like cell towers and data centers. These are all property types that were good businesses before COVID. Um, You know, COVID effectively exposed the weak links within commercial real estate um, and the stocks of those companies I just mentioned did even better um, during COVID. And as we said today, they continue to be really well positioned on fundamentals. I would say that, you know, we have seen a fundamental improvement in some of the more cyclical property types. So, you know, hotels, uh, retail might go in that bucket. Those are doing a bit better today. But obviously, as we sit here in the middle of June, things in the macro environment are quite a bit different than we might have thought they would be six months ago. And we need to be forward looking. So I think, you know, our bias today would be, you know, more towards those long term winners that we think can do well, almost regardless of the macro environment. There's demand in place in a good economy, but also in a weaker economy. So, so Greg, I have to ask you, right, when we look at the data around rent, you know, it seems like rents are, are basically rising everywhere. Does that translate in any way to an opportunity on, on the way you look at the real estate market? So you're right. I mean, rents across almost any property type and almost any geography are are growing. And that, you know, to the earlier point, that is inflationary. Um, and you're benefiting from that if you own real estate. I think, you know, the, the biggest opportunity, candidly, is actually for people that can look at private real estate versus listed real estate like we offer through JRE. We're, we're investing in listed companies. The key differentiator there is that their stocks, they reprice every single day. The stock market is very efficient at pricing in the current environment. Now, I bring this up because you know we've seen a tremendous amount of capital flowing into private real estate vehicles, non-traded REIT, and there isn't. We think there's an arbitrage to be had there. So, if you look at some of the private vehicles on a year-to-date basis, they are reporting returns of roughly plus five or six percent year-to-date. Listed REITs, like a lot of equities, have had a rougher year. Listed REITs are down 22% generically year-to-date. Now, the assets that are owned by a listed REIT versus a non-traded REIT are very broadly comparable. The fundamentals are very good in both cases. As you said, rents are going up in the buildings owned by the listed REITs. Rents are going up in the buildings owned by the private REITs. I think actually the biggest opportunity today is to take a look at that allocation and say, can I buy you know, listed REITs at a almost 30% discount to where the private REITs are marking their assets. And the answer is that right now that's an opportunity that's available. So it's, it's a little bit, maybe a different answer to your question, but in that, you know, universal strength across commercial real estate, we have a, an opportunity depending on the wrapper that you're accessing it through. Yeah. I mean, in this market, anytime you hear the word opportunity, I think that that's something we all start to just gravitate towards. Tim, I want to come over to you. Uh, you're managing the Janus Net Zero Transition Resources ETF, J0, JZRO. Equities have certainly been under pressure, but is that is that happening in your world too? You've got the, this world of resource stocks. Thanks, Doug. Yes, uh, J0, very interesting um, active ETF in resources, I'll just spend a couple of seconds just to say this is a natural resources. So for the listeners, just be aware, a very broad definition of resources, and I'll come to your to your question about what's happening, but when we talk natural resources, we're talking things like critical metals. You can't have an EV or an electric vehicle 
or you can't have renewables without copper or lithium. Iron ore gets turned into steel. You can't have wind turbines offshore New York unless you have good quality steel. Resources include wind and solar and water, and you, it includes hydrogen. And, and also sustainable resources, which goes down into recycling of materials and sustainable ag, which includes alternative proteins or forestry. So a very broad definition of what we can have in J0 and what that is, essentially means when you ask the question, what's happening? Lots of different things are happening across lots of different products. And these things happening are related to the supply chain that supply chains um, under lots of pressure, either because of COVID restrictions in general or COVID in China. You've got the geopol geopolitics of um, China and, and um, America and more onshoring in America. You've got tight labor. You've got shortages of commodities because of the Russian invasion of, of, um, uh, of the Ukraine. So a lot of volatility in commodities um, but a lot of different subsectors that we can head to. And as Nick alluded to, big changes over the last 20 years, with one of the biggest being the fact that the world is in the process of decarbonizing. And that means a whole new host of opportunities for, for our J0. Yeah, let's stay on that topic, right? So, this global move to a, a low carbon future. Does that create any opportunity for investors, especially during inflationary times? It, it does. It does. It works both ways, though. Inflationary times, I think if we look at companies in our portfolio and we're underweight renewables at the moment, uh, say offshore wind turbines, those companies have suffered a lot. The cost of copper, aluminium, steel, all of those, for the reasons I've talked about, the, the, the price of those commodities have come up. Uh, renewable companies have been caught short with fixed price contacts, con contracts and margins, margins are through the floor. So on the negative side, we'd be light on something like offshore wind turbines. On the other hand, when we look at companies that are decarbonizing like Smurfit Kappa, which is a packaging company, or when you look at a, a PD, Air Products, which is a hydrogen company, and DSM, which is an animal nutrition company. All of those companies, big plans and big um, ways in which they can decarbonize, they're all good value. But in an inflationary environment, they can all pass on their costs very, very quickly. They've learned over the cycles, we've got to be in a position to have short duration contracts uh, and, and cover our costs rising costs very quickly. But, but the granddaddy of them all and why a good example with commodities inflation and how our team um, and can look for good opportunities would be copper. Because with this renewable, with renewables and electric vehicles, the amount of copper required in the world by 2030 is probably going to be another 4 million tonnes on a 25 million tonne market. The trouble with that, if you're in the copper industry, the grades of your mine are going, mines are going down. It's harder to recover the copper. Also, permitting is a big issue, as it should be. A new copper mine might have taken five or six years to get going. It's now 10 or 15 years, and we're heading into a real supply crunch. And we can the, position the portfolio. Copper price currently $4 or $4.50 a pound this supply crunch could see that go up three times. And this is the sort of thing that we can position for and outbeat inflation, if you like, uh, at the base level. Yeah, so Tim, you know, clearly you, your team, you you, you guys are following everything in, in sort of the, the low carbon future space. Are there companies or innovations <clears throat> in particular that, that you look at and say, boy, this is really exciting? Look, it's a very exciting field, decarbonization. Re remember, um, you've got to take something like 40 billion tons of carbon out of the world system over the next 30 years. That's a massive, a massive thing to do. And some of the innovations that we're going to need, we're going to need big innovations in agriculture. Uh, the cattle industry over there in America and South America, 
the dairy industry, big emitters, uh, emitters of, of uh, greenhouse gases. And there's one company called Royal DSM. They have uh, invented over 10 years of R&D, they've invented an additive uh, that reduces the emissions in cattle by 80% and by dairy cows by at least 30%. This is a very, very sustainable company, and it has its own supply chain, which means it's handling inflation very well. So Royal DSM would be up there. On the copper side, you've got a company called Ivanhoe Mining in Africa called in the DRC. They've got the highest grade copper in the world and the, the lowest carbon footprint. You've got Freeport McMoran in the south of America with new leaching technology to produce copper at very, very low levels of carbon. And then you've got companies like, I mentioned, Smurf at Kappa, Nucor, Ball Corporation, uh, Ball, B-A-L-L. They, they recycle 120 billion cans a year of aluminium cans. You can't do that unless you've got the best technology and the fastest plants in the world. And finally, an example, there's a company called Champion Iron, uh, in Quebec, they produce low carbon iron ore. They've got a new technology that'll make that feedstock available in America to what's called the EAF, electric arc furnace companies that make steel cheaply and at a low carbon footprint. So they are, they are some of the examples that we have in uh, in our J0 net zero transition portfolio. Uh, clearly a lot happening in your world, Tim. Thank you for, for sharing some of those different ideas. Nick, I have to come back to you. Kind of final question here, but if you're an advisor listening in, I mean, obviously we, we talked about JRE, we talked about JAAA, we talked about J0, but how do they, they engage with you, your team? How do they learn more about the lineup of ETFs at, at Janice Henderson? Yeah, thanks, Doug. I mean, look, there obviously there's a lot of resources out there. Um, you know, easy place to start is just at the website, which is JaniceHenderson.com. And there's um, both retail and advisor dedicated pages there for people looking for more information. Um, you know, we have a pretty active social presence on on LinkedIn and on Twitter and these sorts of places where you can can kind of get more current in, info as, as markets are, are moving. And then obviously for advisors, uh, we, we, you know, we have a, a team of professionals across the country. And so um, if you're uh, uh, not covered by some Somebody already today. There's certainly somebody who lives not too far away from you who'd be more than happy to, to chat more about these products. But but Doug, thanks so much for having us in. It's great to to be able to talk about inflation right now. And 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 for even for me, just hearing everybody on the call, it just it, it's so nice to hear the range of solutions um, that can be brought to bear because I do think there's there's just so many investors who are feeling a little. Um, a little helpless right now, and, and they don't. I don't think need to feel that way. I think there are solutions, um, and it, it just takes a little work and, and a little bit of digging. But again, thanks for um, thanks for having us on, Doug. Yeah, it's really my pleasure. And and Nick, John, Greg, Tim, thank thank you all for being here and sharing all of your ideas. That is a wrap on this edition of the Inside ETFs podcast titled ETFs for Inflation. Now, as a reminder, you can find this episode as well as many other episodes of the Inside ETFs podcast on the New York Stock Exchange's website, homeofetfs.com. Thank you again to the team at Janice Henderson for being here to share your insights. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes featuring thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm Douglas Jonas, head of exchange traded products at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Schwab Asset Management is proud to support the Inside ETFs podcast. As one of the nation's largest ETF providers, Schwab Asset Management offers insights and perspectives that can help advisors build on their ETF expertise. Did you know that more millennials are choosing ETFs as their investment vehicle of choice, or that many investors plan to increase their allocation to fixed income, smart beta, and actively managed ETFs? Find out how ETFs can support your clients' goals with Schwab Asset Management's educational resources. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash ETF know-how.